Avid viewer Bronson Roca and his friend George wanted to see this Brachiosaur toy. Uh, and he asked whether it was a Brachiosaurus or a Giraffa Titan and why. I say that it is a Giraffa Titan because it is what I would expect a Brachiosaurus to look like. The animal we refer to as Brachiosaurus is Brachiosaurus altithorax. The animal that we usually picture when we imagine that creature is actually Brachiosaurus uh, bronchi, which is the African specimen, which is now called Giraffa Titan, and that's what I'm going to call it for the rest of the episode. The formation that we find Brachiosaurus in and Giraffa Titan in um, are both from the late Jurassic period. They're from about 150 million years ago. One is in Western North America, and the other is in uh, uh, what's called the Tendaguru Formation in what is today Tanzania. There was a German paleontologist by the name of Werner Janensch who led what is probably still the single largest dinosaur dig in human history in 1909 through 1913. Um, and he extracted hundreds and hundreds of bones from Tendaguru and brought them back to Germany. And by far the most spectacular of them was the Brachiosaurus. You can see it mounted in, in the Natural History Museum in Berlin. He assigned it to Brachiosaurus because to him, the bones looked really similar. And as a result, people have absorbed Giraffa Titan into their conception of Brachiosaurus. When you imagine the head and neck of Brachiosaurus, what you're actually imagining is Giraffa Titan. And there was an American paleontologist who pointed out that Brachiosaurus is actually known from pretty scant material. We, we didn't have a head or neck, but it was kind of ignored. It was in the late 1980s that Greg Paul actually called attention to how different the specimens are. And he decided that we would be better off putting bronchi under what's called a subgenus, and he called that Giraffa Titan. That name never really caught on uh, in the ensuing 20 years, because probably because the subgenus is not really used in dinosaur taxonomy all that much. It was in 2009 that a paleontologist named Mike Taylor took a rigorous look at all of the bones that we can compare between the two specimens, and he found major differences in all of them which led him to conclude that Giraffa Titan is actually a separate genus from Brachiosaurus. And then in 2012, um, a paleontologist coded them separately as separate um, phylogenetic units uh, in his analysis and found that Brachiosaurus is actually closer to a couple of early Cretaceous North American Brachiosaurus than it is to Giraffa Titan. So what are the differences between Brachiosaurus and Giraffa Titan? Well, the three of you who care about the specifics of the systematics between the bones have already read the study, so we're going to focus on the gross differences. Compared to Giraffa Titan, Brachiosaurus has a longer torso by about a quarter and a longer tail by a fifth to a quarter. Uh, it has shoulder sockets which poke outward, sort of. They're oriented laterally, um, as opposed to Giraffa Titan, which has the more standard backward and down facing shoulder socket. Giraffa Titan and Brachiosaurus both have really slender forelimbs, uh, arms. Uh, Brachiosaurus has the more robust of them, which leads us to conclude that Brachiosaurus was probably carrying more of her weight over her arms than Giraffa Titan was. All of that said, they are still really similar animals. Like until 2012, they were considered what's called sister taxa. They were closer to each other than to anyone else. Um, the Tendaguru formation is really cool in that respect. You'll see animals there that are really, really similar to their corresponding animals in uh, Western North America. Whereas when you look at Western North America compared to South Africa today, the wildlife is really different. That's what's called high endemism. Whereas in the late Jurassic, when Pangaea was still breaking apart, you had low endemism or maybe middling endemism because they were not the same exact creature in both places on opposite sides of the world, but 
they were really similar. You have a Brachiosaur in both places, you have the low browsing sauropods in both places, you have an Allosaur looking uh, carnivore, you have Stegosaurus in the north and, and Kentrosaurus in the south. It, it, they're, they're sort of mirror images of each other, but they haven't reached that really specialized place that, that you would see in the Cretaceous when the continents break up further. So the fact that they're separate genuses is pretty cool because it's tracking the separation of the continents with biology. Getting into the actual toy and what we should change about it. The head, for starters, is entirely too large relative to the animal. Uh, uh, giraffe Titan did have a really big head. Like, if I rolled myself into a ball, I would be about the size of a Giraffe Titan head. But because the animal is so enormous, uh, uh, the head looks tiny. Brachiosaurus is kind of the Empire State Building of dinosaurs. It was the largest dinosaur at the right time to become really famous for being the largest dinosaur. But again, when you're thinking of the American Brachiosaurus, you're probably thinking of the African Giraffe Titan. Now, the animal was large, and it was extremely tall. It could look into a, a fourth-story window or maybe a fifth-story window, but it wasn't as heavy as you would expect, at least based on current estimates. And part of that might be due to the air sac system that sauropods had. All um, sauruskians actually had an air sac system, but in sauropods especially, which would have allowed them to have larger bones without their bones being super heavy. Uh, and especially in the neck, you can see how that would have an advantage because it needs to be able to move that neck around and not have super huge muscles to do so. It would have used ligaments more than muscles, uh, which is why it had these really long cervical ribs on its neck vertebra, not as long as what you would see in like Mamanchisaurus or anything, but still respectable length. And if you didn't follow the link in the Apatosaurus episode to the Sauropod Gigantism article that is available for free online to read, shame on you, go read it now. It talks about how sauropods were able to grow to such large sizes and how the neck and the air sac system actually played into that. So aside from the head, the, the main thing that strikes me about this uh, toy is that They've given it sort of a Camrosaurus type body proportions as opposed to what you would expect from a Brachiosaur, which is, as the name implies, Brachiosaurus is arm lizard. That means its arms are longer than its legs. <laughs> this toy's arms are not longer than its legs, so let's fix that. Um, the upper arm bone, the humerus, was actually not that much longer than the femur, but it was longer. Uh, the same goes for the forearm and the shin. The hand, the manus, was really long. The, the wrist was higher up than the ankle, which carried everything upwards. The shoulder is higher than the hip, and the shoulder is lower compared to the spine than the hip is to the spine. So just all of this is, is tilting the animal upwards, and the torso is basically egg-shaped with the pointy ends facing backwards. The tail should be higher off the ground. It, it's not dragging its tail, at least, which I like, but the tail basically goes straight out after the hip. It doesn't curve down like that. I do like that the legs are underneath the shoulder and underneath the hip. They're, they're supporting the creature from underneath like a dinosaur would. Uh, uh, it's not uncommon to see sauropod toys with their legs sprawling like the old restoration, but it does not have an accurate number of fingers and toes, and especially the hand is a little too uh, plantigrade. It's, it's, as a sauropod, it would have been walking on a, a sort of hoof made of fingers. It was on its fingertips walking. Uh, it only had a claw on the first finger, and there would have been five, whereas this one only has three. Um, on the rear foot, you would see three nails or claws, uh, doing that sauropod thing where they go off to the side. And it wasn't a super elephantine foot. It wasn't round, but it did have a fleshy pad under it. Um, and another thing, when it was supporting its weight with its limbs, it, that, that limb has to be columnar. It has to be straight, as, as opposed to this more flexible, athletic look that they've got on this dinosaur, which would be cool, except that this animal is so huge and its legs are so relatively spindly that to support the weight, it, it needs to be transferring the weight through its joints down into the ground. 
The neck should go into the back of the head, not into the bottom of it like they have in this toy. And I think it's fairly intuitive uh, to imagine what it was using that neck for. After all, it is called Giraffe Titan. It was a high browser, whereas the sauropods that it was sharing its environment with would have been middle browsers. So this guy was, was eating from the treetops, whereas the rest of them maybe could hit the treetops by feeding tripodally, but it's slightly up in the air whether they would have been able to do that at all. And the advantage of that long neck with that little head on it is that she has a really large area that she can feed from, a large volume that she can feed from without moving her massive bulk around. Efficiency, really, is what it comes down to. Taking in a lot of energy without expending a lot of energy. The device with which she was taking in all of that energy was this head, which looks like an artistic caricature of a, of a Brachiosaur head, which we should start calling Giraffe Titan head because the only Brachiosaurus head we have doesn't look quite like this. Um, it's a little too Carithosaurus looking, like the, the crest wasn't that perfectly spherical. And the snout on Giraffe Titan has this weird bowl shape to it uh, uh, in the front. Now you'll usually see them restored with their nostrils uh, up above the eyes where the, the bony naris is. As I mentioned in the Patasaurus episode, that's probably not accurate. They would have had the fleshy nostril where you expect the fleshy nostril to be, which means that sometimes you'll see restorations that are filling in a lot of that distinctive Brachiosaur face with flesh. Um, these are actually grouped together with Camarasaurus and some other animals into Macronaria, which means big nose holes, or more, more colloquially, just big noses. So reflect that in the toy, give it a big nose. The eyebrow ridges are not bad. This is an animal that actually has bony ridges above its orbits, but the eyes are too far forward on the face. They should be further back and probably further up. And the whole head is just super narrow, which is not accurate. This is kind of surprising to some people, but when you see uh, Giraffe Titan's skull uh, in front view, it's really wide. It's, it's almost a circular mouth which tells us that it was probably not the pickiest of eaters because it has this big mouth to be just raking in a bunch of leaves at one time. And it didn't process its food either. Um, um, like most sauropods, it would have just taken as much food into its gullet as it could and just let the gut handle that. So our takeaway from this today is that there is a whole world of sauropods out there. A lot of people can really only name maybe three. They can name Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus, they can name Diplodocus, and they can name the tall one, which is Brachiosaurus. There was a lot of diversity in these animals, uh, not just in the late Jurassic, also into the Cretaceous period. And Giraffe Titan is a good place to start getting into those because the image of Giraffe Titan is already in your head. You just didn't know it. That's about all I can say about Giraffe Titan. Thank you for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Comment with dinosaurs you'd like me to have on the show. You could even send me a toy dinosaur. Our address is in the description. Go to thegeekgroup.org to find out who you can become a member and donate and get involved at our Leonard Street Labs in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And we'll see you next time. If you've only seen our videos, then you've only seen the smallest fraction of what the Geek Group is. It's a place where you can craft, improve on, manufacture, repair, rediscover, test, discuss, research, and share just about any project in a one-of-a-kind massive facility with tools and equipment you might otherwise never get the chance to touch, let alone use for your own projects. The Geek Group is a learning institution. We're people with different skills, backgrounds, and perspectives, figuring out how to make ideas a reality and sharing those insights with everyone. To help you along the way and to get help from you are tens of thousands of members from around the world connected to the lab in real time through internet relay chat and live streaming video. A single-minded appetite for knowledge and a drive to create are traits common to all geeks. We found a way to amplify those traits, a way to give you the resources you need to improve lives. 
get involved at thegeekgroup.org. We thank the Future Girl Foundation for the grant that made these videos possible. GIMS! And the thousands upon thousands of purchases and private donations from members and viewers like you that keep this place running. Thank you.